Pygmalion lived on the island of Cyprus during a time of artistic and cultural splendor. This man was no ordinary sculptor. His skill in shaping marble and ivory was renowned throughout the region. However, Pygmalion harbored a deep disappointment in his heart despite his fame and the respect his work commanded. Surrounded by natural beauty and human creations, the imperfection he saw in the people around him, especially women, tormented him the most. He observed them not only for their physical appearance but also for their attitudes and behaviors, which often seemed to him to lack the grace and purity he longed for. This perception drove him into self-imposed solitude, rejecting loving companionship. Pygmalion began work on a new sculpture in his workshop, surrounded by marbles and tools. It was a female figure carved from pure, gleaming ivory. Day after day, he shaped the statue with deft hands and almost obsessive dedication. Every curve was smoothed, and every detail was perfected with astonishing patience and skill. Something unusual happened in the sculptor's heart as the female figure took shape. Pygmalion began to see in his work not only a reflection of his ideal of beauty, but also an object of affection and desire. The statue, which he called Galatea, possessed a beauty that transcended what Pygmalion had seen in any living woman. Her sculpted face displayed a serenity and grace that captivated him, and her forms were of such perfection that they seemed to defy reality. In the evenings, Pygmalion would spend long periods contemplating his creation. He would talk to her, read poetry, and even bring her gifts, such as jewelry and delicate dresses, imagining how she would look and feel if she were a woman of flesh and blood. The statue, inert but immaculate, became the center of his world. His love for Galatea grew daily, fueled by the illusion and hope he placed in every detail he sculpted. The sculptor, now completely in love, wished with all his soul that Galatea could become a real woman, able to reciprocate his love. It was a deep desire, born of pure and sincere love, which the gods would soon hear. On Cyprus, the sun-drenched island blessed by the gods, a great festival was being held in honor of Aphrodite, the goddess of love and beauty. It was a day full of rejoicing and devotion, where the island's inhabitants paid homage to the goddess, thanking her for the blessings of love and passion she instilled in human hearts. Although usually withdrawn and dedicated only to his art, Pygmalion decided to attend this festival. His heart, filled with unrequited love for his inanimate creation, yearned for some relief or solution to his torment. Surrounded by couples in love and offerings to the goddess, Pygmalion felt even more isolated in his unique love. As the festival reached its climax, with dancing, singing, and offerings, Pygmalion approached the altar of Aphrodite. There, among the statues depicting the goddess and the scents of incense and flowers, Pygmalion raised a plea not for riches or fame, but a love to fill his lonely heart. I ask not for a wife such as I know, said Pygmalion, but for love pure and true, such as I have placed in my Galatea. If only she could be more than a dream in ivory, if only she could share with me life and love. Aphrodite, who watched from Olympus, was moved by Pygmalion's genuine devotion and pure love. It was a love free from the trivialities and vagaries often accompanying human desires. The goddess decided that such pure and sincere love deserved to be rewarded. Returning to his workshop, Pygmalion's heart beat with hope and doubt. The statue of Galatea, motionless and perfect, stood before him, bathed in the soft evening light. He approached it, his hands trembling slightly as he touched the cool ivory. He closed his eyes and let his lips gently brush the statue's forehead, a gesture filled with love and desire. As Pygmalion withdrew, an inexplicable sensation enveloped him. The statue seemed different, as if something had changed in its essence. Intrigued, he approached it again. Touching it again, he felt warmth. The ivory, once cold and hard, now had the softness and warmth of human skin. His eyes widened in awe and wonder. Galatea, under Aphrodite's spell, began to transform. Her ivory skin turned to living flesh. Her once lifeless eyes glowed with a human radiance. Pygmalion recoiled, overwhelmed by the miracle he was witnessing. The statue, which had been his creation and his obsession, now breathed. Her lips sculpted delicately, curved into a soft smile. 
Now a living woman, the statue looked around, marveling at her new existence. Her eyes met Pygmalion's, and a deep connection was established between the creator and his creation. Pygmalion, overcoming his initial surprise, extended his hand to her. The woman smiled sweetly and stretched out her arms toward him as if she had been waiting for that moment as much as he had. Pygmalion, filled with wonder and gratitude, took her in his arms and held her close to his chest, feeling his heart beat in unison with the woman who now came to life. In that instant, Pygmalion's words fell short of the magnitude of the moment. Galatea, the woman born from his hands and heart, was alive, a gift from the gods, a miracle of true love. Pygmalion, filled with gratitude and love, knew that his life had changed forever. With her newly bestowed existence, Galatea was beginning her journey with him, a journey full of possibilities and unconditional love. Pygmalion and Galatea, united now not only by art but also by a deep love, began a new life together. Their relationship was a testament to love and devotion, where the once lonely and disenchanted sculptor found in Galatea his masterpiece and his life companion. The wedding between Pygmalion and Galatea was a grandiose celebration in Cyprus, blessed by the presence of Aphrodite. The goddess of love, pleased with the success of her divine intervention, granted them happiness and a harmonious marriage. The union between the human and his creation, which had come to life, was seen as a miracle and a sign of divine favor. In his daily life, Pygmalion continued to dedicate himself to his art. Still, now he has a new muse and companion. Galatea, for her part, learned quickly about the world around her, displaying a curiosity and intelligence that delighted all who knew her. In time, the couple had a son, whom they named Paphos, after the city of Cyprus. Paphos grew up to be a noble and robust young man, inheriting his father's artistic talent and his mother's grace. The family lived days full of joy and love, an example of the perfect union between human creativity and divine power.